Now I'm here in my capacity now as the um, as the sort of interim head of the Natural Resources Initiative. So so you'll be hearing from each of the initiatives. You heard from the Eye Collections Initiative, from the Informatics Initiative. There's a Natural Resources and, ha and Hazards Initiative, Biodiversity and Training and Origins and Evolution. So you'll hear from each of those. So you can see the kind of diversity of of sorts of data that we're that we're generating, the kinds of diversity of needs that scientists have within the museum. So um, the natural resources and hazards, if you think about that from a museum point of view, that's an enormous set of things. That could be anything and everything. So we had to focus in on this. And so we focused in on three key projects, which are a sort of a pilot for how we could make our data connect better to the outside world. And for want of a better kind of way of tagging these, we've called this rocks, pox, and crops. And, the, and these, three, these three projects within the initiative, the first of which is called is ROCKS, and that's called Critical Elements for New Technologies. And I'll explain to you a little bit about how, what these are about as we go along. But mostly what I want to talk about is what types of data we'll be generating, what types of data we, we will be working with in these, in these projects, and also what our informatics needs will be for these projects. POX is emerging is a project looking at emerging and neglected diseases, and CROPS is something looking at crop and pest wild relatives. Now, to just encapsulate these, the, the lead of ROCKS is Richard Harrington, lead of POX is Tim Littlewood, and I, with other people, are leading the CROPS project. Now, the ROCKS project is about these critical elements which people use for new technologies, and these are things like lithium and cobalt. These are elements which are in very short supply in the Earth's crust but are in increasing demand by human populations. And you might think of lithium as something that you might think of as being in lithium batteries that you might not use for very many things, but I would bet you money each of you has in your pocket or in your hand something that has lithium in it, which you will throw away and not recycle necessarily, which is your mobile phone. So lithium is one of these things that's in very short supply. We're going to need more of it, and there's not very much of it in the world. So one of the, the key element for this project is to look at our mineralogical collection, chemically characterize that for some of these critical elements which are necessary for new technologies, and then work together with industry to look at mining and exploiting these critical elements, and also perhaps how we can use um, knowledge of how those critical elements are formed in the Earth's crust to help with recycling of those elements in the future. So this is, involves um, three-dimensional geographical modeling, which is not just global location where it is. It also is elevation above the surface, but also, more importantly for this, is elevation below the surface as well. So this is real 3D geophysical modeling. And this has already attracted considerable interest from industry and also from the National Environment Research Council, for which two grants have re recently been awarded to museum staff who are working on this initiative to, to do this kind of work. The work in the POX uh, project has to do with looking at our collections of parasites, parasites that are important for both human and veterinary diseases. The museum is increasingly seen as a kind of as a as a laboratory of reference for many sorts of these parasitic diseases, but yet our collections aren't brought to bear on the kinds of questions that our collaborators really need the answers to. So part, one of the key elements in the POX project is to, is to digitally capture information from, from those collections, but also one of the really important planks of this project is to collect new 21st century collections, which involve, um, involves going out, doing metagenomics, and collecting collections that actually are genomically characterized as well as just being things in jars. So that involves working with quite a lot of partners and, and for being, becoming a sort of diagnostic center for these kinds of parasitic diseases. The CROPS initiative um, builds on work that I've been doing for, for the past um, several years with uh, the CGIAR center at SEAT in Colombia, and also with, with colleagues at, um, at Q in the Millennium Seed Bank, looking at the distribution of crop wild relatives. This was a project in which we looked at the distribution of relatives of the tomato, the potato, and the eggplant, and looked at whether or not gene bank collections adequately reflected the wild species range. Now, in the tomato and potato, they do beautifully. The eggplant or aubergine is a total disaster. 
the world's gene bank collections completely don't reflect the wild species distributions of the wild relatives. So that's a big problem for improving a crop. We decided to try to take this one step, well, rather two steps further, which is going to be a bit challenging, and to look not only at the crops, crop wild relatives, but also at the ma some of the major pest groups that affect those crops and their wild relatives, and to look at those in space, but also with an orthogonal axis of phylogeny. So the groups that we chose for that, of the many pests there are of crop plants, are um, beetles in the genus Leptinotarsa, which are chrysomelid beetles, and we'll use a few other genera as well, um, psyllids, which are homopterans, little jumping lice, and um, various groups of flies, gephritids and agromyzids, which are major fruit pests as well. So all of this kind of feeds on a data set which I've assembled in Solanaceae source, which I showed you this morning, of which has all of the plant um, information is georeferenced already. So what types of data do we need in this initiative? What sorts of data do we need? I put RP and C for the rocks, pox, and crops bit, is we're going to need and have 3D georeferenced geo specimen data, and that's going to be needed for all three of these projects. Phylogenetics is going to be an important component of both the pox and the crops projects. We need to look at hosts. We need to look at these relationships, like Vince was talking about with his louse data, in all three of the projects. One might not think that minerals necessarily have hosts, but in fact, most of these rare elements, like lithium and cobalt, are found within other minerals, and so therefore you can treat those as conceptually the same sort of thing. We're going to have to look at environmental variables for both rocks, pox, and crops. They're going to be important for doing modeling in the future. Sequence and chemical data, again, quite similar types of data, very, very big data, and those are for all three of these projects. And the POX project will definitely be creating diagnostic tools for use over what we hope will be a web interface. So that's lots of different data types. And I was a bit surprised when surveying my fellow natural resources and hazardsers as to actually how much coincidence there was between these three extremely different projects and the data types that we need to work with. What do we need? That as well is something that's quite straightforward and simple. There are four main things that we need. We need to be able to integrate various broadly dispersed sources of data in standalone analysis platforms. We need to be able to pull data from different places and analyze them within something that we can tweak ourselves. It isn't just a generic solution. That might be a very specific solution for a specific question. We need to have easy, hassle-free transfer of data in and out of those platforms. The data goes in, we clean it up, we do something to it. We want to be able to transfer that back out to, say, KEMU or another, another main data set, to GBIF, to a GBIF partner. We need to have that be easy and hassle-free. We need to have agile content delivery over the NHM website. This doesn't mean just content delivery over the NHM website. This means agile content delivery, quick, easy, updatable, um, straightforward. And we actually need transparent criteria for open data. Now, you all heard Nigel talk about open data, and we're all enthused about having open data, but some of the data associated with particularly our critical elements type projects may be quite important commercially and rather sensitive for some period of time. What we need is a set of criteria that will allow us to unambiguously say what things are open and what things are not open at the minute. So those are the four things we need, and we need those pipelines to do this, to pull all these data together. So that's really what we need. So there you go, guys. Go away and do it. So thank you.